Okay. <laughs> oh, I've actually got the Zoom feed has come in. It hasn't been happening recently. I've just been winging it. So yeah, I can actually see a proper preview of what it looks like. How are we all doing? Um, oh, although I then look at the front end of YouTube and it gives, <laughs> gives me an error message. So working in the back end, not working on the front end. No, I think you guys can hear me and see me. Um, uh, yes, a little bit of Hardy Weinberg, maybe some variation. Hardy Weinberg, I've, students, my students often ask me to go through examples. I've got probably a couple of tricky ones, and they are. T I can show you the way that some of the examples are asking the Hardy Weinberg stuff, and they are. They've added. Previously, there was one example of like a slightly more complicated version of it. I mean, it's the, the equation is the equation. It's pretty simple, um, but making you do one extra step at the beginning. Um, I'm not going to give too much away right now because I'm sure we'll, I'll find an example of it for you. Um, uh, who were just, okay, in fact, I see people asking what are we doing and how you might find out what we are doing. So I will um, just for the, I'm guessing lots of people will be watching this, not quite figuring out who we are and what we're doing. There's, there's lots of new subscribers joining us every day. I'm just going to share my screen here and go to, oh. Okay, it's going to share my browser with you for a moment here. Okay, so on the Taylor Tudors homepage, taylortudors.co.uk, you have the Exambulances here. They're free courses to help you guide your study at home, to support you if you are going to be doing those um, autumn exams. We've got an announcement for year 13s tomorrow. I can't say any more about it right now. We will probably create a scheduled YouTube live when we can announce it. Um, we don't know. I'm not going to talk about it anymore because uh, we. I'm just. We, it's just not the time to talk about it. So the schedule inside the exambulance, the A level schedule, is what I'm going to be following. This is today. Maybe we could have put. If this was very hastily put together, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is here, and evolution speciation tomorrow. Okay, so I don't not won't step into the realms of speciation. We actually did quite a lot of that. I've been trying to mesh together this week with some of the AS classes. So they form a nice little like, homogenous um, bit because a lot of you have said you haven't done these things at school or college. Uh, you haven't finished them. They are topic six for end of module six for OCR. And also, I mean, AQA students, I'm sorry, your spec is all over the shop. Um, and I, you do some of the inheritancey stuff is all AS stuff for you guys. So like, I, I had to just go with the majority. Um, obviously, if you do want the full support of me in the course, then our courses are there should you want to just like basically study from home and prepare yourself for any of those exams. So let's see if there's any questions in the chat. Yeah, the exams will be in the autumn is what we've heard. I would imagine that's going to be September. Um, we don't know that for sure, um, but I would I'd say that's the most likely. I'm going to turn this brightness down a bit. I'm a bit underlit. Um, how many we got in here right now? It doesn't tell me. Um, how many, of, how many of you guys are subscribers? How many of you don't have a subscription? Just give me a yes versus no. Subscriber, not subscriber, just to give me an idea of whether you, how many people here have got all these videos at their beck and call or not. Wonderful. Okay, so in the last class, I just did some, I just went on some random tangents and gave some sort of interesting biology side notes, which are not particularly going to help you with your A-level exam. Are you interested um, in having just some interesting tidbits thrown in once in a while? Okay, you like that. I'm glad because I've been looking for a way to disseminate biology in like the stuff that's outside of the spec for some time. Let's find what I'm going to be doing here. Start with a bit of variation, I think. Let's start with some of that. I like to keep these pretty, pretty loose in terms of, I basically want to respond to what you guys want the most. And I, I can include some questions. Hardy Weinberg, the best thing to do is just to do some questions and I can sort of explain the points as I'm going. So I'm going to kick off with a little bit of variation. I don't want to hang around with it too much unless I get carried away with some stories. Then I'll do some Hardy Weinberg and then we'll finish with some questions. How does that sound for a an overview. I need to just line up everything here so I can see all the comments. 
if I end, if I get struck in Australia, I'm going to buy myself another monitor. If I can get one delivered, everything's shutting down here because of coronavirus. Pop quiz. How many of you know this? What's the name of the virus? I'm going to do some lives on the virus at some point when I get 10 seconds. How many of you know this? Oh, wrong, 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 right. SARS-CoV-2 is the actual, the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, I think is what it's called. That's the virus, the disease that it causes, the illness is COVID-19. Fix my camera, what's wrong with my camera? Is there anything particularly wrong with my camera? Is it just out of focus? Oh, laggy and blurry. I can stop my video and start it again. If I don't think it's my camera. I can have a little look at the lens here, but I didn't get any. Let's just, let's just try. Oh, I've got to stop my screen sharing first. It's, my preview of me is looking okay. So I'm just going to try. You probably get to see that for a second. Does that do anything? Yeah, it could just be YouTube resolution. Everyone's using the internet. I checked mine before I started. It was as good as I, well, it's all I've got. So <laughs> if we get cut off, then that's that. Okay, let's, let's do some screen sharing and just get on with it. Less chat, more doing. Well, and you're going to be seeing the iPad anyway, so. Um, variation, variation, variation. So what is intraspecific variation and interspecific variation? Intraspecific. So intra is within intranet. Intra, so I would say individuals of the same species have the same genes, but they have different alleles, which means there's variation in their phenotype. It means within a species. I have blue eyes, you may have brown eyes. We both have a gene for eye color. Eye color actually is a polygenic. There's many genes that interact to form eye color, but if, we, if it was just green or brown or blue, then I would have blue, you would have brown. So there's variation due to the different alleles. So then we have inter, intercity, oh, that's not haste, but inter, is it? Inter-specific, intergalactic, internet, intercity. So this is individuals of different species have different genes and live in different environments. They can have the same genes, but generally speaking, there's a there's change to individuals with the same species have the, exactly the same genes, and different species. Obviously, us and chimpanzees, as I said, ninety four percent of our DNA is going to be pretty much in common, so we have many of the same genes. But they don't; they do have different genes as well. Have, have different genes and live in different environments. So there is also variation between species phenotypes, between phenotypes of species. 
Can I zoom in a little? I can get a bit closer. Is that, oh, is that better? Obviously, you can go full screen. We've got continuous variation. They don't, it is required to know what these things are and discontinuous. There's not sort of direct questions on this, so I'm gonna go over it quite quickly because it's more of an understanding point. Um, in fact, so in fact, I'm gonna start with the graph. So this is where you're gonna get pretty much a um, standard distribution that I was just talking about in my, have our mean here. So this might be height height of human being, or could be weight of oak tree. And this is number of indivs, number of individuals. And so most people are average. This could be um, marks on your A-level biology exam. Some people get really high marks. Some people get really low marks. Most people get average marks, which is why the grade boundaries between um, uh, an A, a C and an A is small because most people fit in that gap, which is why they stretch the data to try and make more differences. Um, so continuous variation, variation with smooth, continuous. It's basically controlled by multiple genes and the environment interacting to give us a, many, 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 possible outcomes and give you a range. So variation is smooth and continuous. Um, generally, you're gonna represent this on a line graph. That's the question they could ask you. Well, how would you represent this? and height and weight, I've given examples already. So discontinuous variation is individuals fall into discrete groups with no intermediates. Discrete means you kind of unique. Individuals, or you may be phenotypes. Fit into discrete groups. In fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave myself a bit of space. I'm gonna move discrete groups into and so there's um, no intervals. So how would you represent discrete different groups? bar graph. Could be male, female, could be blood group, could be tall or dwarf. So A, maybe B, could be A, B, O, and again, number of indivs. This bar chart was generally, how many genes are likely to be involved here? generally going to be controlled by a single gene with few alleles. That means with my W over. Because if it's basically just like tossing a coin, do you have this one or do you have that one? So that's why it's, it's generally single gene. Are you tall or are you dwarf? What are some genetic causes of variation? Mutation. Mm -hmm. 
random fertilization. Okay, and we've got meiosis of which there is crossing over. And that is independent. I'm going to say segregation here, segregation, because it's the separating that is really the you shuffling, crossing over, new combination of alleles, uh, independent segregation is a new combination of chromosomes. And obviously fertilization is also a new combination of chromosomes because you're blending chromosomes that didn't um, exist in that combination before. So inherited characteristics. Um, so I'm going to say genetic variation. results in evolution. Definition of ev evolution is the change in allele frequency over time. Um, results in evolution. Uh, it, obviously we've got natural selection. Well, let's maybe just say by natural. So the genetic variation creates new phenotypes, new proteins, new phenotypes. Some of those phenotypes are better adapted for their environment. They are more likely to survive and reproduce. Some of those phenotypes are less likely to survive and reproduce and are more likely to become extinct. We also have environmental causes or contributors to variation. I'm going to say environment changes phenotypes. Um, it, I'm going to say it can change over a lifetime. So this is your phenotype. How does it affect your phenotype? Examples would be accent. I did my, one of my dissertations I did on tropical marine ecology in, in Tobago. And I remember just before leaving, there was a blonde sort of 15 year old girl who I totally thought was like a Swedish girl on holiday. And she started speaking with the thickest local patois, like proper local, but blonde, blue eyed, fair skinned. And like that acts, you know, the accent is an environmental, um, <clears throat> um, we could have, oh, Siamese cats I've written here. Si, Siamese cats. You know what happens if you put, I do not do this. Siamese. Do you know what? I'm not going to say what I was going to say. Um, what happens if you put, if Siamese cats get really cold? Do you know what happens to Siamese cats? They change fur color. They do, they go white. Um, basically, but most variation phenotypic variation is a result of both um, environmental and genetic variation. Um, So we could have examples. So are your parents, obviously tall, tall parents likely have tall children, but also we, the increase in mean height of homo, homo sapiens in England since the last 200 years is mostly down to improved um, nutrition. Nutrition in, in uh, adolescents and young people, infant nutrition. So I don't know if that's how you spell Siamese. Someone can correct my spelling in the chat. I'm going to just say um, height. So it's, we've got genes, tall parents have tall children, and we have, uh, I'm going to put infant um, nutrition. There could be some epigenetic things in there. Not everyone does epigenetics. I'm not going to go down that road. Let's have a little look over here. 
I'm going to just do a few of the predictions of the Hardy Weinberg equation because a lot of people do not pay very much attention to them. So um, <laughs> you can't read my right handwriting anyway. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Guilty. I'm sure if you watch it back with the words, you will figure out. I'm sure I said at least I said everything as I wrote it down. So it should be gettable for you. Okay, let's um, prediction. So it, the, the Honey Weinberg principle predicts that the frequency of alleles in a population will stay consistent, will never change, will just stay the same always. So the frequency of an alleles in a population An allele, I probably should have been an allele of a gene, but an allele in the population will stay constant over time. The assumptions of the Hardy Weinberg, what does it assume there for? It seems that there's no mutations happening. It's going to assume there's no selection pressures, that one, one phenotype isn't more likely to survive and reproduce than the others. So there's no selection pressures. Um, that there's random mating. Yeah, I'll take that one. The males don't choose females or females don't choose males because of a particular trait. That would be sexual selection, actually. Um, sticklebacks and lots of peacocks, you know, it's Fisher's runaway hypothesis. That's maybe, maybe I should do a little series on just interesting tidbits. Fisher's runaway hypothesis and peacock tails, amazing. It also assumes that there's a relatively large population because what happens in tiny, tiny populations that weirds out the genetics a little bit? You have tiny, tiny populations, that random chance of basically random, random fertilization of gametes means that you don't know which of your alleles are gonna be passed on. On a large population, you can assume that the averages are just gonna balance out. Rare alleles will be passed on sometimes, common alleles be passed on most of the time. But if you've got a tiny population and a rare allele isn't passed on, it can just go extinct, and just fade away. So large populations means that there's no genetic drift. That's not on everybody's spec. If you've never heard of that before, don't panic, unless you're an AQA student, in which case it's a tiny part of the spec. Basically still don't panic. <laughs> um, also that the population is, you, it's not breeding with anything else. I'm gonna say it's genetically isolated. Because if you, again, like you know, Homo sapiens interbreeding with Homo neanderthalis, that is gonna introduce new genes. If you're mating with people from a different place, then that's gonna be introducing new genes. And that there's, I haven't put no migration. So again, basically this is kind of similar here that you're not getting mixing of genes from other populations. None of your genes are going out, no other new genes are coming in. The two equations are P plus Q equals one. So if there's an allele with, you'll only get examples with a gene with two alleles. Here you've got the dominant allele is P and all of the recessive alleles. So if there's, if there's only um, tall and dwarf, there's no, other, there's no other third allele that's possible. It's just saying that the only possible genotypes here to be homozygous dominant, or you could be, um, so this would be P squared. You could be homozygous recessive, which would be Q squared, or you could be heterozygous, which would be 2PQ. But in total, here we've got only Ts, big Ts, and only little Ts. So all of the T alleles mixed up is equals one or 100%. Um, so this is dominant. I'll put all, all of the dominant, all of the recessive. equals all of the alleles. Of that gene total. The other equation is the homozygous recessive plus the oh, actually generally 2PQ goes in the middle. Two because you've got two alleles of the gene. We are diploid, right? We've got one big T, one big T. So that's why there's these are squares and twos. Uh, T. <laughs> 
losing the plot equals one. So again, this is just saying that this is all of the organisms present. They're either this, they're either this, or they're this. Oh, yeah. Oh, see, it's just nonsense, isn't it? Yeah, thank you. I will make mistakes like that. So yeah, this is, I would just drew it out in this order. This is how you would normally draw it out. Doesn't actually matter how you draw it out. P plus Q equals one, P squared plus two PQ plus Q squared equals one, but you don't. Okay. I think the best way to practice this is some questions. The skill here, what I don't, this is not a key term that you're gonna really there's no value in, I was going to write the key term in here, the Hardy-Weinberg principle. I'll give it to you verbally. It's a model that predicts the frequency of alleles and genotypes and phenotypes in a population. You don't need to recall that. You don't need to regurgitate that. You, need, you know what the Hardy-Weinberg equation is because the questions, you need to know the information I've put on the page. I'm just trying to go a bit more quickly here. Oh, you want to do this is the tricky one. Okay, so what do we know? Um, we know that you've got the two alleles of a gene. Or I should hmm, I'll see if I'll see if we can if I can do this. What do we know in terms of the question? Okay, I know what I should do. I know what I should do. I'm going to stop my screen sharing now. I'm going to find that question in the past paper. Um, I'm sure it's in here. If it's not, oh, I know it helps if I spell the words correctly. Searching. Can I fill it all in? Oh, no, I'm just going to do. Okay, let's do this and this. Come and find, send it to myself. Okay, this is the Okay, so this is the question. This is one of the tricky ones. This is like the trickiest that they get. Don't charge into this one. What do we know? Okay, so in fact, before we go about answering the question, what can we do with Harley Weinberg questions? You are always going to know one of a couple of things. You're either going to know how the frequency of the P, the dominant allele. You're either going to know P or you're going to know Q. Or you're going to be able, it will tell you what P squared is, or it will tell you what Q squared is, or it will tell you what 2PQ is. So these are your possible starting points. And what do we know? The first thing you have to do with any of these is figure out which do we know. So let's look at the question. The shells of a snail may be unbanded or banded. The absence or presence of bands is controlled by a single gene with two alleles. That will always be the case. 100% you will not get a single gene with three alleles. Not going to happen. Um, the allele for unbanded, big B is dominant. The allele for, in fact, I don't need to underline allele, for banded is little b and recessive. A population of snails contains 51% unbanded snails. Okay, this is, I've, I've told you a little bit of a porky here. This is the, the most complicated. So what do we know? This is tells us this in combination with this tells us everything we know. 
So 51% are unbanded. What possible genotypes can give you an unbanded snail? Boom, you've got it. There's multiple genotypes that can give us because unbanded is big B. So these are either homozygous dominant or heterozygous. So this would be the equivalent of P squared and this would be the equivalent of 2PQ. So what do we do now? What, how can I, I can't begin. I can't do anything with that. But yes, we can, because we know that P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared is equal to 1. So 1 minus P squared minus 2PQ. Oh, oh lordy. Equals Q squared. So 51% equals these together. So 100% of the population minus 51% means that 49% of the population are little b, little b, because they're the only three possible outcomes. Big homozygous dominant, heterozygous, of which we, we know combined, both of them are unbanded and they're 51%. So they're 49% little b, little b, 49% is q squared so q squared is equal to as a decimal 0 0.49 and now what have we got to actually do find those that are heterozygous so we're looking to find 2pq so the only way to do that is to find what first of all we need to find q so with square root 0 0.49 to give us this is going to give us q Someone's gonna to have to do that for me because my scientific calculator is packed in my bag because I tried to get on the plane today. Zero point seven, of course, seven sevens are 49. Makes total sense. Yeah, so Q equals 0 0.7. So now we can use the equation P plus Q equals one. So one minus Q is equal to P. So one minus 0 0.7 is 0 0.3. That's one I'll let you do in your head. So then that equals P. So now to find 2PQ, it's 2 times, I'll put P above, 0 0.3 multiplied by 0 0.7 equals our answer. This is Q, and this is our final answer, which is, please, 0 0.42. Dead or 0 0.42 with extra bits on the end, because I'll go through this asks for it as a percentage. If it's 0 0.42, which I'll write down, then it, the answer here, because it's a percentage, we have to give it as a, okay, if it's dead on. If it did get, generally they won't. If this is a, has extra values on it, then this given you 51% here. So that's the maximum resolution that we've got. So we would be given it to two decimal places here or given the percentage. We wouldn't have written 42.6, for example, because the original, we don't have the, we, we can't be sure that of any decimal because we were given values to the nearest round number. So we wouldn't, in fact, I might just leave that there and put a cross through it just so that you know that you would give it, this is effectively two decimal places. This is, that is the hardest one that you you can ever come across. I went straight into the deep end there. Um, Answer the universe, life, the universe, and everything. I'd say, well, if you're not a massive Douglas Adams fan, whilst you're at home and got loads of time on your hands, read some Douglas Adams. It's genius. Um, uh, I'd say reproduction. If I'm going as a biologist, basically heredity. DNA is greedy. Make more copies of DNA. But in current socio-economic climate, I think replacement is the two children as an environmental. Uh, environmental limit to that. Douglas Adams. Douglas Adams born in Cambridge in 1952 and his initials were DNA. Cambridge, the structure of DNA was, was discovered off base in Cambridge in 1952 by Watson, Crick and Franklin and a few others.
he's an author. He wrote Hitchhiker's, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Sorry, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is what he wrote, the first book. Um, do you want another one? Let's go do another one. No, I don't want to go to my photos. I want to go to my live class handout on evolution is what I want to do. A lot of people saying that this is too early for them. And I get it. I totally am not a morning person myself. My, I have some experience of isolation to some extent. I lived in a yurt in the countryside. When I came back from South America, when I was starting uh, tutoring, I, lived, I bought a yurt and lived in a yurt in the countryside. And I spent lots of time on my own because I would work painting and decorating houses all day. And then I'd be tutoring all evening. Uh, and then I was never there, I'd be playing squash when I like, I didn't, I had, there was a shower on the, on the, um, the place where the yurt was, but I basically was playing like decent level squash at the time and playing matches twice a week, training twice a week. So I basically showered at the squash club. And um, so I, yeah, I'd say having a routine really useful and daylight. We're coming into summer now, so it's less of an issue, but like, don't end up being nocturnal. Like it's really terrible for your mental health to be, to not see that much sunshine. Um, given that we're coming into summer, probably not a big thing, but some students were saying that they're not going to bed to 4 a.m. and then probably not getting up that early. Like getting that cycle is probably not gonna be the most healthy routine to get into. And I think we're gonna need that more than ever, like right now. Um, okay. And again, these were the videos. These are all linked to the course. That's what I was covering. This is going to be a more simple one, I would assume, right here. I haven't done any of these since I did my live class on it. So let's see what we can pick out. Again, I want you to tell me, what do we know? What do we know from the question? We're going to, do we know P squared? Do we know Q squared? Do we know P? Do we know Q? Do we know 2PQ? Do we know that P plus 2PQ equals something and therefore 100 minus that is Q? What do we know? That's the thing you've got to do. Sea otters were close to extinction at the start of the 20th century. Boring, 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 not relevant. Following a band, not relevant, not relevant. Okay, study the frequencies of two alleles of a gene. Not relevant, not relevant. Okay, so here we've got the dominant allele T codes for an enzyme, the recessive allele little t, does not code for a functional enzyme. Population of the allele, frequency of the recessive allele was found to be 0 0.2. What do we know? Yeah, we know Q. Yeah, so this is saying that, so we know Q. So Q is equal to 0 0.2. What do we actually have to work out now? The percentage of homozygous recessive. Okay, well, that's just Q squared, isn't it? So it's just 0 0.2 squared, two twos, uh, 0.2. What do we get? It's never never obvious when you're squaring uh, decimals that are less than one. 0.04. Yeah, so 4%. That's a simple one. I, I told you I threw you in at the deep end. That's, how do we know? So this is just the allele T. That's how we know it was Q. So if you're having trouble isolating what's what, because this is T and we want to find, so T is equivalent to Q, homozygous recessive is the Q squared. Mm, probably one for the calculation, maybe one for giving as a percentage. Okay, so, what does the hardy weinberg principle predict about the frequency of the T allele after 10 generations? Stays the same. hardy weinberg principle assumes that there's going to be no evolution, that the allele frequency remains constant forevermore because that population, no selection pressures. There's nothing doing in that population. It's like a population frozen in time. Um, let's not do that. Okay, what is the out? Look at this, three marks. What does it predict? Again, this is, this is more AQA. Don't freak out too much, OCR students, because you don't tend to ask this. Probably it, the, what's written on the spec is so vague, they would be within their rights to ask it, but they probably won't. It's going to, like, I'll give you a 90, give you a 10% chance of them asking this whilst 
the duration of this new specification exists. So not on your exam, in all the exams. Okay, the, 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 this is a separate question. So the, the, the allele frequency of a population will not change, will remain constant over many generations and assume, and then stick in a couple of the assumptions, um, we don't have to give all of them, it's only three marks. So assume there's random mating, there's no migration, some reasonably large population, there's no selection pressures. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is a nice one. So I put this in. So we've got frequencies of some alleles in the population of cats in three cities. Okay, so we've got Athens, Paris, and London, white, non agouti, blotched, and long haired. White cats are deaf. Would the Hardy Weinberg principle hold true for white cats and give a reason? So one, probably for the yes, no. I, whenever you get questions like that, when you've basically got a choice between yes or no, I would try to give two supporting points for the explain because the, the command word here is explain. So give reasons. Whenever we see this, it means give reasons. So I would say this question is give two reasons why you support or don't support. We've just said, okay, so what does the Heidi Weinberg principle predict? It would affect the allele frequency will remain constant. Are you more or less likely to survive compared to your peers if you're deaf? As opposed to saying there's no advantageous, I would say it's, it's a disadvantage selectively disadvantaged you are more likely to die on a population level if you're deaf because you can't hear a predator coming up behind you for example um you, if you're an urban cat you might not hear a car coming and get flattened by a car um so you are at a selective disadvantage and the hardy weinberg principle assumes that there is no selection pressures so there is going to be a selection against this and so the answer would be no because white cats are deaf, they are more likely to die, they're less likely to survive and pass on their genes. So the frequency of the white allele or the deaf allele basically is going to decrease. It will change over time. Again, I will show the mark schemes for these, but I want to go to the general principle of this. I want to do the What is the evidence from the table that non agouti and blotched are alleles of different genes. So we're looking at this column and this column. Okay, well, either of these, but I'm just going to highlight the bottom one here. They add up to more than one. You can't have, and so you're basically we're saying like together, there's more than a hundred percent of the organisms carry these. You can't have more than a hundred percent. Either you have this gene or this gene. You can't have more than a hundred percent of the gene. So they, they must be different genes because they add to be more than one. It's not that they again. Just look at look at our specificity of our wording. They don't add up to one. Doesn't that if they didn't add up, if they came to less than one, then maybe there's another allele that we just haven't considered here. There maybe there's another phenotype that hasn't been included in the data. But if they add to being more than one, is the problem because then it's you're saying that there's more possible genotypes or phenotypes out there than there are possible individuals. It doesn't work. It's the fact that it's more than one. Not that it doesn't add to one. It, I mean, the fact that it doesn't add to one is fishy, but you could be missing stuff. More than one, not possible. So 0 0.76 plus 0 0.81 equals more than one. Same for these two. It doesn't, you can't prove it with here. The fact that these don't add up to one is again, tells us it's a little bit it's a little bit fishy, so, but we don't, but the data would be, I, I would choose the data from these two added together or these two added together. 
again, we've got quite clearly highlighted in the question. Okay. Hair length in cats is determined by a single gene with two alleles. Always, you basically don't have to worry about it. The allele for long hair is recessive. Short hair is dominant. Use the information and the Hardy-Weinberg equation to estimate the percentages. Again, we have to give percentages and there's no, just again, my, as soon as I see that, I just, my eyes flick to the mark scheme. It's not there. You can almost put it in right now because like, just it has it been done for me? Do I give it as a frequency? If it says give the answer as a frequency, that's when you give it as a decimal. Cats in London that are heterozygous for hair length. So heterozygous, we're looking to calculate 2PQ. That's what we need, heterozygous or 2PQ. We're looking for London and hair length. Okay, we've got long haired. So this is a genotype or a phenotype. What is this? Genotype or phenotype? Long haired. Is that their genetics or is that their phenotype? This is the phenotype. Okay, good. Yeah. Which means that is the result of their genotype and their genotype, they're diploid, right? So this is either going to be HH or it's going to be HH or it's going to be this one. And we're going to have to choose based upon the text down here. So the allele for long hair is recessive. So what genotype must you be to have long hair as your phenotype? You can only be little h, little h, which is the equivalent of q squared, right? That's so we know that long haired are these guys. This is the one that these are. So we know that q squared is equal to 0 0.5. So how do we now find q? Well. Square root 0 0.5 is equal to Q, which is 0 0.025, is it? But tell me, because. Because the, the question tells us in, oh, sorry. Mistake, good spot. Okay, so it's like self-checking there. I was like, this is little square, little, which is the equivalent of Q squared. Okay, so 0 0.33. Sorry about that, my bad. Yeah, I mean like, okay, so I highlighted it here. What I what a good another good bit of exam technique is that when when you get to that, yeah, you pick it out in the question, you highlight it here, go back to the table and highlight it in the table immediately when you're reading that, come up here and then just select it. Just and obviously once we're reading this, we don't know whether we're looking oh no, we do know we're looking for long hair. So if you underline long hair when you read long hair and you underline London when you read London, you can maybe even then highlight that cell if you have to go back to the question and then you can come back to it. You're just looking ways, that's what in the MID sheets, those FFFs, FFS, like when you just like, oh my God, like that's a classic example. If had I finished that equation and I just used this value, like I'd have done everything right, I would have got it, got the answer wrong. Cause I was just like, oh, why did I do it? Or partly cause I was chatting to you lot, but um, I'm gonna finish this one off pretty quickly here. So wait, what is the square root of 0 0.33? 0 0.57. Okay, so I think this is 0 0.57 something or other, it's 5744. And then you do, that's Q. So one minus Q is equal to P. So one minus 0 0.5744 is equal to um, 0. Point, um, is that, am I right with my numbers here? 
what do I get on the calculator? 0 0.4255, 0 0.4255, something or other. And you would round to two decimal places, so 0 0.43, which would be 43%. Champion. Okay, give me some, give me any uh, could better ifs. Give me some better ifs for these sessions. What would you like? Like how pace, you want in terms of the content. Uh, I, I didn't put any of those numbers into my calculator. Uh, let me, I don't have a calculator. What is the square root of 0 0.33? Let's just run through these so no one's mega confused. I will reshare my screen. Oh, okay, you're quite right. I haven't finished the answer yet. I'm getting so carried away with finishing on time. I just wanted to stop there. Okay, so Q, let's, let's finish this off. We have not yet finished. Do, 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 do. Five, five equals P. So now two, in fact, let's not do it down there. Two times P times Q equals two PQ, which is two times by 0 0.4255 multiplied by 0 0.5744 equals our final answer, which what do we get here? 0 0.4902. So again, round to two decimal places, 49%. Much better. Thank you for saving me from multiple errors <laughs> whilst nattering. Good team. Okay. Um, can I show the mark schemes? I can show the mark schemes. Uh, well, what did... oh, we sent me back to the beginning. Which, can you remember which question number it was? That was our first question. Oh, hang on, what's going on here? Do, 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 do. Add to more than 100%. Two marks for the correct answer, 44.2. One mark for incorrect answer. This mark scheme might be wrong here. I'm fairly sure we did it right. I'll just go pay attention to it. One mark for an incorrect answer, which P is the frequency of A. Let's just go back and have a look at the, um, don't freak out too much about this. Could be that there's an error in the mark scheme. Just, I'm just gonna delete all this stuff from here so I can just look at the question unadulterated. How long have I got? Oh, not long, because Ronnie's gonna be kicking me out. Okay, what do we want? We want, let's just go back to the question, figure out what we actually want. I think it's heterozygotes, right? Heterozygous for hair length, okay? And we know long haired is recessive. So these are HH equals 0 0.33. So we square root that to get um, equals Q squared. Square root that to get Q. One minus Q equals P. Two times P times Q. I'm pretty sure that we have done it right. Does anyone, I just don't have my calculator. I can do it on my Mac here. Let's just do this. Just going to double check that we are right. So 0.33 square root. Oh my God, I wonder how do I use this? Yeah. And then memory plus clear one minus memory recall equals times by two 
Where's my We got it right for sure. Whatever's on the mark scheme, it, we got it right. <laughs> There's not one I'm not one in any doubt about. And I will make a note to myself to go and find that and correct it. Um, good pace, thank you. Yeah, like better ifs. I'm gonna. I need to log off because Ronnie needs to get her live set up. But um, leave me leave me some comments in the in the comments. Funnily enough, um, if you've got any, yeah, if you'd like to do any specific types of things. You reckon, oh, I'm planning them less and they're getting them, they're getting better. <laughs> okay, great. I'll see you next time, hopefully tomorrow. Oh, that's not end stream. That's end screen share. <laughs> I'm losing the plot. I found the button. Bye.